Hello everyone and welcome to The Link Up. Today it's a special show as we look at the Bussa Rebellion, what was its impact and where are we 206 years down the road. The anniversary of the rebellion is also the start of our season of emancipation and we'll discuss this year's celebration. But even more engaging is the whole discourse on reparations. That will be the highlight of our second hour with guests from here in Barbados and Ghana. Today, Senator John King fills us in on plans for the season of emancipation. One of my favorite historians, senior lecturer in history and head of department at the UWI, Dr. Henderson Carter, breaks down the Bussa Rebellion for us. And joining me today to bring clarity to the move towards reparations is our ambassador to CARICOM, His Excellency David Comijon, and also his Excellency Ambassador Kwesi Kwarte, who is the Deputy Chair of the African Union Commission. Unfortunately, Ms. Lisa Hanna, Member of Parliament for Southeast and Anne, and Opposition Spokesperson for Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade in Jamaica, is unable to join us today due to an emergency, but she has promised that she will join us at a later date. So, stay with us. It's going to be a highly informative link up. Remember, you can participate. We love it when you do. Watch the stream on Facebook and YouTube and share your comments and questions in real time on Facebook at CBC Barbados. Senator John King joins us after the break. When you can see that we can't win. The victory, my friend, has already been won. The people have turned their minds and their backs on slavery. They will no longer show it tolerance. It is over, Jackie, and the end slavers now know this. Generations to come will know that we show the world how we feel about slavery. They will know that we honor ourselves by demanding respect and reclaiming our dignity. That buster is not enough. It is more than enough for men and women to die for freedom, for the truth. Dignity, my friend, is the finest fabric with which to rock one's soul for its homeward journey. It is time to bring the regiments together. We must stick to the plan. Rally on Bailey's, secure the perimeter, run them out of St. Vera. Thank you to the NCF for that. And thank you to Senator King for joining us today as 
Egypt. Today we take a look at the Basra Rebellion 206 years later. The anniversary of the rebellion, Senator King, is always the start of our season of emancipation. Thank you so much for joining me today. Tell me, what are you going to be focusing on for this particular season? Okay, first let me say thank you very much, Peter, for having us on. Um, this, this year, we're definitely going to be fit, um, focusing a lot on the educational aspects of the season of emancipation. Um, oftentimes, we, we get the sense that it's all about the celebration and, you know, the crop over aspects which are part of the season of emancipation. And we tend to focus a lot on that. Deliberately this year, though, we are ensuring that various generations of Barbadians have the opportunity to have access to a little bit more serious discourse Good. on um, the rebellion, on emancipation itself, on all of the things that we want as a new republic going forward. Because, you know, we always say, if you're, you're moving to, you are removed to be in a new republic, then there also has to be a new national consciousness that goes along with that movement. And the season of emancipation this year will focus heavily on events and programs and projects that lead towards building that new national consciousness. And it first starts with us being able to identify with ourselves and place a value on the events that brought us this far, thus far. I'm really glad to hear that. And just let me put in a little plug here for the link up and also for CBC, because you know that over the years, we've always been at the forefront of getting that information out there um, and getting in contact with the, with the resource persons who can, can bring that information to life. And that has always been one of my criticisms, actually, that you know, people hear emancipation and, and so on, but what, what was it really? What were the times like at that time? And, and how did what happened then impact us now? And that's one of the things that I want to look at today with Dr. Carter when we take a look at the Basra Rebellion, because there's so many names who've been left off you know, history's page, I think, when we talk about the Bassa Rebellion. Yes, we talk about the right excellent General Bassa, but there were so many more from many plantations across the island, not just Bailey's. Agreed, agreed, Peter. And, and one of the things that I'm also trying to get people to understand that when we talk about the season of emancipation, we also have to look at it in its much broader sense. Right. Not just in terms of the emancipation of the then slave class in Barbados, but as we, we go forward in this 2022, there's some habits, there are some things that we as Barbadians do that, that we also need to emancipate ourselves from. <laughs> you know, and, and, and we must begin to see it in its very broadest terms as we as we go forward. But I think um, that this year uh, and Please excuse me if I sound overly excited about it. The truth <laughs> is I am. And I'm Good. also on location at the Division of Culture right now. So if you hear any noise in the background, there's a hyper activity happening. And That's it starts, fantastic. it's already started with a visual arts exhibition, which is being um, held in the choir as we speak. Um, it's called Coming to Self. And a number of Barbadian artists have, have already placed some fantastic work there and I want to take the opportunity to encourage people who are watching the program now that if they have uh, a minute to spare and they pass through, um, they'll they'll see an exhibition that will stir your soul um, and, and get the juices flowing for what is to come for the rest of the season. Now what the did season you say starts, is the name of it? I'm sorry. What's the what's the theme? Coming, coming to sell. I'm going to steal that for one of my themes for, for the link up, if you don't mind. I love it. You can steal it. You can steal it. <laughs> Coming <laughs> to self. All my ingredients should steal it now. Yeah, that's Coming perfect. That's perfect you for, for um, because again, what I said, all that happened before impacts who and, you know, what we do and so on. Now, yes. 
And, and, I, and I want to stress all the time, too, that this is a Barbadian season of emancipation. Because oftentimes we, 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 we sometimes begin to think that this is only about persons of African descent, but it's for everyone. And, and, and the emancipation of things, as I mentioned earlier, is, is, is about all of us. And yes. who, who and what is it we want to create going forward? So we have this exhibition that's going on. Um, throughout the day, Peter, there are going to be performances um, throughout the mall. They've uh, consented to allow us to use various spaces there so that their shoppers and whoever have that experience of uh, the beginning of, of the season of emancipation bring some life to it. Uh, we look forward to that. And also, there's a press conference that will kick off this afternoon at 3.30 in the food court itself of, 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 of the Sky Mall. And there you will have some speeches uh, and again, some performances. All in all, uh, the season itself has a number of events. It starts today. It ends on August 31st. So you can see the length of time that we're going to be celebrating uh, who we are and who we want to be. And this is going to have a number of lectures. Uh, we have a family day that we're going to be recognizing. We have Marcus Garvey day you're going to be recognizing. We have our very own Jackie Oakville day that we're going to be recognizing. But as soon as the, the um, press conference is finished today, we're going to release the actual calendar of events oh, so that everyone can have it, can have it and they yes. can pick and choose what events they want to go to. But I want to be um, uh, encouraging families, and I, I'm going to stress on that all the time. And when I say families, I don't mean just your blood family, your communities, um, your friends, your work colleagues, your all families. I want you all to come out and support all of the events that are, that are going to be on because this is where we begin to bring our people together to share in a common experience that I think is secondary to none. And I believe that this is the first step in this season of emancipation of us creating um, a, a season that other persons from around the Caribbean and I dare say the continent, probably North and South America, would want to join us as we go forward in this experience. And there's no, no better time than now when Barbados has a certain amount of, of presence in the international world. And I think this is, this is, this is really the time when we, we get to show the world who we are. Yeah, and, and you, you know that <laughs> there are some people in this country um, and I'm not just talking about individuals, you know, by the wayside. I'm talking about people that would surprise you. Who says that Barbados has no culture? I, I know. I've heard it for many years, and it, it, it hurts my it hurts my stomach. Um, but but that that tells you, Peter, a little bit about the bang up job that was done on our people. Exactly. And, and these are these are these are what what your face with now is dealing with the residue of that mental slavery, shackles. of that psychological age, that those shackles and this season of emancipation is all about breaking those. Now the process is not going to be easy no. and it's not going to be done you know quickly, but you have to cut away at it bit by bit by bit by bit. And this is what the season of emancipation is all. No small feat, I can tell you. Um, I know that you've got your work cut out for you. Um, I'm happy to hear that it encompasses all Barbadians. So we're going to learn as well about the journey of the Barbadians of Indian descent. Um, That's right. You know, I, and I think that part of their culture has alienated them from the rest of us. And I'm happy to see that they're opening up more and more and so we're getting to find out you know more about them and certainly that's one of the things that i'm looking forward to in 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 finding out and learning more about their culture um we have some indigenous people who are here right that's right we well. have a hundred approximately mm -hmm. 100. 
and yeah. it's the best kept secret ever you know <laughs> so um this yeah. is a perfect opportunity for us to really get to know and to embrace each other not literally because we're still in COVID, but you know yeah. each yeah. other yeah. as cool. as as a people and and yourself yeah. now um as a person who has been part of the cultural landscape for so long, I want to know where we are at with the beginning. And I'm talking about the young minds, the little ones. You know, yes. how is this season being drafted and explained to them? And, and how are they going to be participating? Are you all doing like uh, liaising with the Ministry of Education or doing it across ministries or is it only going to be the Ministry of Culture? Well, even it, it, it is cross ministries, but it, it is also looking at some of the other entities that fall underneath the Division of Culture. So for instance, the National Library Service is going to be having an event which is catered towards our young people, where there will be storytelling and there will be things that speak to the African experience and to our own Barbadian experience also um, in that, that, this, that, that gives them the opportunity to participate. There are also going to be visual art effect, um, events where you will see art from some of our young people in schools and, and different things like that. And then there are the ones that I spoke about earlier, which are going to be geared towards the families, which encourage the adults along with their children to come out. There's a culinary um, event that's going to happen in May, on the 21st of May. And at that, um, that's where we get to share the diversity within Barbados. It's, 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 in, it's an international day for cultural diversity. And we're going to be using food as that thing that brings people together. And when you spoke earlier about, you know, having that East Indian uh, experience, those are the type of things where you get hands-on learning in terms of, nice. you can see how things that have been prepared, you know, preparation of, of foods and different things and sampling of them. So our kids are going to be encouraged um, to not only come to these events, but to also view the lectures and the different things that are going to be happening on social media. And again, um, as you mentioned earlier, CBC is always in the front of helping us. And I know that the, all the things that we're going to be streaming also, that, that you guys will help us to get that message from here. So Most it's definitely. all encompassing. It's, Most it's all encompassing for everyone. I'm going to hold on to you for a little bit longer, if you don't mind. Um, because okay. for the first time in I don't know how many years, um, AgroFest is actually going to be falling within the season of emancipation. Um, right. Unfortunately, because of a pandemic, but it's kind of worked itself, you know. Um, and when you're talking about us as a people, you're talking about an identity. And part of our identity is our black belly sheep. And, yes. you know, we've got an interesting... Um, amalgamation between two countries happening with the Barbados and, and Guyana agreement yeah. and so on. So lots of lovely things that are different, but I think important are happening within this particular season. So we're going to talk about Very. that when we come back.
we're chatting with Senator John King as we take a look at the Busser Rebellion and its impact 206 years later and one of the I think examples of that is you know the whole idea of a season of emancipation and what is emancipation really what do you consider emancipation to be um, immediately one thinks about freedom but mm -hmm. you know freedom from what because freedom as you mentioned can be external but it can also be internal you know mm -hmm. freeing yourself from certain exactly. mindsets certain stereotypes remember right. when yes. agriculture was thought to be lesser than Oh, and yes. This pandemic made us realize that it definitely is more than. How oh, important our farmers are, yes. I agree yeah. with you, Peter. And, and, and that's why you, you would always, um, and, and I agree with you, that we, we need to push the idea of emancipating oneself also um, from those aspects of your own character which do not serve you well. <laughs> you, you know? And so the emancipation um, is important. And as you would know, if you, if you have a baby and you, you're holding it for too long, at some point you start to see it doing this wriggling, mm -hmm. wriggling, wriggling. Mm -hmm. Even a child looks forward to that day when it, it makes its own decisions, when it grows up to, be, to become a young adult. And you don't have to wait on mommy and daddy to say, go here, go there, stop, do it, to make its own decisions. And so for the average human being, that is also important. And, and so that emancipation in its broadest terms, one can, one can put it towards those things that you might find hold you back from being the best version of yourself possible. And you can, in this season, think about emancipating yourself from those thoughts. Yeah, I, I like that. And I like the fact that you're saying to me that this year as well, you're going to be focusing more on the educational aspect, because I think that that is a, a big problem that we have had in the past. Um, there's been a, a separation about that. We've had the entertainment aspect. Yes. But, you know, yes. um, the reason why we're doing what we're doing um, or why we're entertaining you has not always been fully explained. And I keep on telling people that I remember we did West Indian history when I went to BCC um, for A-level. We didn't do it for all level. Well, um, that's what we um, dinosaurs used to do before CXEO games called all uh, levels GCE. But you know, so I could tell you how many wives Henry the Eighth had, how many lived, and how many were beheaded. You know, right. I you, can. You can speak of Harold in the War of Roses. Thank exactly. you, and, and exactly. battle, I think, at 1066, you know, exactly. with William the Conqueror. But <laughs> to tell you the name of an African king or an African queen and the fact that yes. they had African kings and queens and that, you know, mathematics and all of these things came out of the continent, which then moved throughout then the rest of the world, of the world. Um, that was unheard of. And slavery, you know, mm -hmm. it was Bobby Morris at BCC at the time who then opened your eyes to a whole other world. Trevor Marshall opened your eyes to a whole new world that, you know, and unfortunately, that was just a short space of time. So it was why I asked if the little ones are going to be a part, and I'm really happy to hear that they are taking part. They will. And, and you know, Peter, if I may, I'd really like to congratulate at this particular point in time all of those names that you mentioned earlier, along with the history department at UWI and stuff, for the work that they have been doing. And I think the season of emancipation will benefit a lot more from their engagements and from having them involved in the various things that we're doing, which we're seeking to do. And so 
I think that, and, and, and I'm going to choose my words here very carefully, but the deprogramming and reprogramming of, 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 of our people um, is important. Because there are a lot of, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of old stereotypes and a lot of old mindsets that still um, are being preserved uh, by, 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 by people as being the norm. And those are the things where I think the educational aspects of education um, is going to be crucial. Yes. And, and as you said, we can also use the entertainment, because I, I, am, I am a strong believer that theater, film, dance, poetry, uh, visual arts, music, can be part and parcel yes. of that re-educating program. You know? yes. So it can be entertaining and educating at the same time. And this is the balance that, we, that we're seeking to, 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 to have in this season of you know, I'm looking forward to most July 26th in that new Golden Square. That is going mm -hmm. to be a goose pimple moment, I think, for many people that, that we're going to be, you know, celebrating that particular um, series of events at that space. Um, with that wall of names of those who are here and those yes. who were here and who helped build this this nation you know it's going to be a wonderful thing so we start today with the 206th anniversary of the Basra rebellion that's correct and then we move into a whole other series i think we've got africa day coming up sometime uh, a little later in there as well is also panama which will be august 20th those individuals who did so much you know in building up and shoring building. up their families you That's know correct. working hard getting injured, some dying, and you know, dying. but sending the money back to their families here in Barbados. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. sorry, I, I just wanted to say that, that, and that experience also speaks to, in my mind, the resilience and the responsibility of that generation of Barbados. That they went, you know, far off places to ensure that those that they left behind were well taken care of. And I think that is something that needs to not only just remembered, but to be commended and saluted whenever yes. we, we, we have the opportunity. And Windrush should be coming up in June. Um, and that as well, you know, another set of Barbadians yes. who made that That's journey. That's right, who, who made that journey to do mm -hmm. better for themselves and their families. The month of June is also Heritage Month. Exactly. And so there'll be, yes. a, there'll, be a num there'll be a number of things that we will speak about as we go along. Mm -hmm. um, because the time is short and I know you have a lot of people, um, you know, things to deal with, we yes. won't get too deeply into That's a That's fine. Of things. We could do it I month do. by month. Um, that way we can, we, today is just yeah. an introductory session and yes. just a broad discussion, but we can, broad we discussion. can do it, yeah, month uh, yeah, by month. Yeah. Month by month. And then, and then there's, there's the other one which I've been, uh, I'm very pleased about is the Jackie Opel Day, which will yes. be on the 27th of August. You know, I, I saw some articles um, earlier this year, earlier this year, one that was done by a gentleman in England, and he was saying, or he was lamenting the fact Quite. that some of the, the, the persons that he would have interviewed when he did the thing felt that there was not enough being done to recognize um, the contribution of Jackie, Jackie Oppo. And in the season of emancipation, uh, those are the things that we are rectifying as, 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 as we go along to show the world um, that we do appreciate and we do celebrate our own people. Uh, and, and, uh, I'm, I'm happy that we're, we're, we're moving in that direction. Thank you so much. 
Senator King. Thank um, you. Thank you for taking the time. You're very, very welcome. Thank you for taking the time. And I'm looking forward to liaising with you further as the season progresses so that we can get the information out there. Oh, yes, definitely. And, we, and again, before I go, just to let people know, it starts today, April today. 14th, and it goes right through until August the 31st. So you'll be seeing me quite often. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. That's good. We will always welcome you here. You take care and stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Coming up next on the link up, we are going to delve into the Basa Rebellion. You know, what was it? Um, why was it? And the individuals involved in it? Yeah. We're going to get to understand a lot more of this rebellion that impacted us then and even now when we come back. The Basa Rebellion has been described by many as, you know, many different things. It's been called the largest slave revolt in Barbados, the only slave rebellion in Barbados. We have celebrated the life of the right excellent Basa as the Emancipation Statue at the JDC Ramsey Roundabout. But what was the Bussa Rebellion really? And we ask this of a senior lecturer in history and head of department at the UWI, friend to the show and someone for whom I have great respect, Dr. Henderson Carter. Good morning, Dr. Carter. Good morning. How are you doing? I am well, thank you. It's good to see you. It's been a while. I, I can see that all's well, you look well. Thank you. So talk to me about the Bussa Rebellion. I would like to know the why of it. So talk to me about the times. What were the times like in 1816? Well, the, the Bussa Rebellion was a war. I want to call it a war okay. for freedom and independence. And it was a war because of the barbarity of slavery. And when you look at slavery, you could only think of barbarism, horror. And I want to go back to something that happened on April 14th, 1809, to illustrate my point. It is the anniversary 
of this um, event. Now, April 14th, there was an accident Bishop's Hill in St. Philip. Now, that accident killed 20 slaves. 20 slaves were covered as they were working in a marl hole. No. Working on a road, on what we call the Great St. Philip Road. These persons were killed, covered in marl. Five of them were maimed, two without hope of recovery, and three of them were crippled. Now, a thousand slaves from St. Philip were summoned to rescue these, these people who were trapped. And some of them, I believe, might have been from Belize, might have been from River, might have been from Sunbury, those, those plantations that were involved in this Bossa War of 1816. So when you look at these situations, huh, mm -hmm. they tell you exactly why people rebelled. Because when those 20 persons lost their lives, you know what the, the newspaper of the day said? What? The newspaper did not give their names. All the newspaper did was to give the owners of these enslaved people. For example, they cited Mel's Braffitt, the owner of Mount Pleasant, Palmer's and Three Houses, who lost 15 people. They cited St. Clair, Mr. St. Clair, and Mr. Edgel, and Mr. Belgrave. But those individuals who lost their lives, 20 of them covered in one of our biggest disasters, they were not mentioned. The rebellion of 1816 was about freedom from that type of shabby treatment mm -hmm. where people lose their lives they're not mentioned they're not even um, thought about and if we go back even further peter mm -hmm. and a lot of bajans don't know about this but the greatest bajan tragedy was not bishop Hill. it was the King George tragedy of March 26, 1791, where a ship ran aground, a slave ship ran aground off the southeastern coast of Barbados. I believe it is near the, the, the um, Ragged Point Lighthouse, that yeah. area. Yeah. And that ship was laden with over 369 people. Only 88 got out of life alive. 288 perish. Hmm. Perish in the whole of that slave ship. Bussa was fighting to end that terrible slave system. And therefore, that is why I believe we ought to celebrate the rebellion. Quite. Celebrate the war and ensure that there are suitable memorials for the war. Yes, Peter, we have the, the Buster statue. They called it the Emancipation Statue. Barbadians have rechristened it the Buster statue. <laughs> but I also believe there needs to be a monument for the first battle. That first battle in that rebellion. And that battle is called the Battle of Lowther's Hill. Lowther's Hill, St. Philip. Now, Lowther's Hill is, well, I said St. Philip, I think it's Christchurch, that, near that area. Yes. Lowther's Hill, if you're leaving St. Patrick's, you are going to descend down a hill mm -hmm. and you're going to come to a roundabout. Mm -hmm. That area, that area is called Lowther's Hill. Oh, the okay. first battle in this rebellion occurred at Lowther's Hill on the 15th, the 15th of April. And here are these insurgents, according to the newspapers, yeah. are fighting against the St. Philip 
and the Christchurch militia. And in that battle, they are saying to the militia, come on, come on, we're going to fight you. And according to the reports, the, the enslaved people were armed with cutlasses. Some of them had muskets. And notably, they had seized the colors of the St. Philip militia. Uh -oh. So in an earlier battle they, with the St. Philip militia, they seized their colors and they took on the two militias at Lowther's Hill. They were defeated. But the commander of the St. Philip militia said that they were forming an, a, in a regular line. Mm -hmm. In other words, they were displaying elements of techniques mm -hmm. in the battlefield. 30 rebels were killed. One white man was wounded in that battle. And the rioters or the, the, the insurgents had to retreat, of course, because they did not have the firepower mm -hmm. to stand up against the, um, the, the militia. And I this was what date? Was the, you said this was March? The 15th, April. This is April 15th, Easter April Monday. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. April 15th, mm -hmm. Easter Monday, the first battle oh, of okay. that battle rebellion. 30 mm -hmm. people lost their lives. I believe there needs to be a monument there on that Lowther's Hill Road. Mm -hmm. Nice stretch of road going down. Uh, there needs to be a monument to signify that that battle occurred. 30 people lost their lives. It, it was the most important battle of the, the, the rebellion in my view. Right. So how, how did they, and, and I'm not being facetious because I know that there will be people, you know, who will be asking, but all right, how do they manage to communicate? Because, you, you know, they're imprisoned supposedly on a slave plantation because people don't really see that they are allowed to move around freely. Um, they're always under watch. You know, so how did they manage to communicate and plan, you know, all of this? How did they do that? Well, the means of communication was really to attend dances, hmm. to attend these events, and do your planning. As a matter of fact, the, the final planning of that, that rebellion occurred at a dance at a river plantation two nights before. Wow. The final planning. In addition to that, in terms of the broader communication with the enslaved people in places like Draxall and Lairs, Bussa, as you know, had various individuals working for him. King Wiltshire, mm -hmm. Johnny, all John Sargent, you know, Ken Davis, Jackie. people who are working for him. Nanny yeah, Gray going Greg. up there, telling people that they need to do as the enslaved people had done in Sandabang. So on the plantation, even though um, the plantation was a very strict unit. There was some movement. People were able to move and visit their girlfriends and their boyfriends and of course to come back home. Right. So there was some movement around the plantations, not only in St. Philip, but in other places as well. So um, they were able to organize, um, organize themselves for war. And you know, people as far as St. Thomas, Lears, St. Michael participated in this rebellion. As a matter of fact, when you look at the damage done, you see all of these damage and that gives you an uh, indication as to the extent of the participation of the rebels in this war. What did they hope would happen? Um, did they, did they think that they would 
when or did they know that they were sacrificing themselves for a greater cause? I believe these individuals thought that they could win this war. Mm. And I say that based on the fact that they had designed a flag. We call it yes, the Endeavour flag. flag. Mm -hmm. And you don't go to great lengths to design a flag showing the participation of um, British troops helping you and showing um, a, 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 the, uh, a man of war leaving Barbados as well as a family, a, a, a black family reunited, husband and wife reunited on that flag. You don't go to those lengths to do a flag not with this vision of changing the country and you know putting yourself in charge of the country removing the the, the plant and merchant class and assuming the reins of power so i want to suggest that this was not only uh, a rebellion to protest a condition this was a war to seize power and i want to go back peter to something that happened earlier similar event mm -hmm. that happened in 1675 and this event was the coffee the coffee mm -hmm. um conspiracy coffee and his rebels went to great lengths to build an african stool on which he would be enthroned after the success of the rebellion so they were not just rebelling and then making plans for their enthronement but they were making plans for that enthronement even before the war started and that war was again savagely put down and when you look at the evidence in in hillary beckles book um, on coffee you see that persons 17 persons were executed for that conspiracy six of them burned alive peter oh my goodness six of them including a a, a slave called tony his name is on that wall that wall of remembrance in golden square right. and it juts out it juts out it is not su it, it, it suppressing the wall it juts out so that we can identify him clearly wow. and tony had this to say when he was about to be burned tony said if you roast me today you cannot roast me tomorrow and there was another to slave the end. Mm -hmm, wow. Mm -hmm. And wow. there was another slave along with him who wanted to, to um, give the particulars of the conspiracy. And Tony said to him, Thou fool, are there not enough of our countrymen killed already? Are thou minded to kill them all? Those are the words of Tony. And of course, you know, 11 of them were beheaded as well, Peter. 11 beheaded, and their bodies dragged through the streets of Spice Town. Mm. That was the 1675 rebellion. So, to answer your question, yes, I believe these persons who rebelled in 1816 understood that it would be tough, but it was possible. Mm -hmm. It was possible to win a victory against the um, enslavers. Okay, we're gonna take a break and absorb all the information that Dr. Carter has just shared. And, and when we come back, let's take a look at the aftermath. He started on it, um, you know, but also the impact of this war for freedom of which he's speaking when we come back.
We are taking a look at the Basa Rebellion today as the country commemorates the 206th anniversary of the rebellion. Dr. Henderson Carter, our guest, is, has described it as a war for freedom. But what I am learning is, and, and I knew of a few uh, of the you know revolts that he mentioned, but um, you don't keep them top of mind. And so when you realize that these are people, these are human beings, you know, that we're talking about. People always talk about slaves, but they were human beings with families and lives, and they felt, and they lived, and they loved, just like we do. It is unconscionable to, to say that you actually drag bodies through streets and hoist people's heads on posts. I know that it's to place the fear of, of them in, in the other so that they won't revolt, but surely it would also create other bitterness and other anger. Um, but somehow I don't think that they were thinking um, quite so logically. So Dr. Carter, let's look at the, continue to look at the aftermath. We have a, a flag here. Tell me if this is the flag of which you spoke. Is this Correct. the, the Endeavour one? That's the Endeavour flag. And you see on, on my right, there's a ship leaving, mm -hmm. a ship leaving. There's a British soldier as well on the left. And there is some view that the enslaved people believe that the British soldiers, especially the black soldiers of the 1st and 2nd West India Regiment, would fight on their behalf. Remember, they were not only white soldiers. They were oh, yes. black soldiers at Sedan's Fort. Mm. And that that regiment at St. Anne's Fort was 150 strong. And that regiment was the regiment that attacked Bailey's and Golden Grove in what was known to be the final battle in this revolt. Mm. And two of these soldiers lost their lives. Two of these soldiers, these black soldiers, lost their lives. And there were that these black soldiers would fight for them. That did not materialize. The black soldiers routed them. But that flag is important because, as you can see again, if you can put it up again, sure. you can see um, a black man with his family, and that is reuniting the black family. Yes. And you, you see a black man with his suit and his boots, and he has his, his weaponry beside him, and he looks as though he is going to be the ruler of the society. So this flag is an important flag that we uh, that is located in, in in Britain. And I believe, as I said already, that as a republic, we must ask, you know, for this flag to be repatriated. Quiet. But in terms, Peter, mm -hmm. of the before you impact, before you do that, can yeah. I just pause here? Um, put it back up for us, please, Don, our director. Is, am I clear in saying that at the bottom there I'm, say, I'm seeing God always saves endeavor? Endeavorance. Yes. Endeavorance. Yes. Endeavorance. Oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And their view was God was on their side. Yes. God saved these people who are endeavoring to do something to liberate um, humanity oh, ants, yes. from this, this position of slavery from this dreadful um, situation. Mm. So this is a war of liberation, a war of for independence, and this, in my view, is the first Barbados flag. Mm -hmm. We have the, the throne of coffee, or the stool of coffee, I should say, now this, the, the first Barbados flag, 1816. Very significant. Well, quite, quite. Thank you, Director. Thank you for putting it up. I had interrupted you. Continue, please. Yeah. And in terms of the impact of this rebellion, 
And, you know, 144 people were executed under martial law. Another 70 were sentenced to death, according to Hillary Beckles. 123 were transported to Sierra Leone. Okay, they were first sent to Honduras, but the governor at Honduras did not want them because they were branded as rebels. They were sent to Sierra Leone. So here are families being disrupted. And in addition to that, according to an anonymous writer, short of 1,000 slaves were killed in battle. That's not what short we heard. Short of 1,000 slaves, according to Sir Hilary yeah. Beckles in his book, yeah. and I'm quoting from this text, um, you know, rewriting history, Quite. the 1816 slave rebellion. Because and the official quotes, word was less than that, way, way yeah, less than he that. He quotes an, an anonymous short of a thousand slaves. And I, I have reason believe to that. believe this because yep. on the 16th and the 18th of April, 1816, the government issued a proclamation the government issued a proclamation saying to these commanders in the field, the commanders of the militia, that they should obey one commander, that's Colonel Cod, and that they should only attack persons who have taken up arms against the state, hmm. and that they should not attack um, civilians children women etc if we had time we could pull it up in the barbados mercury and mm. bridgetown gazette but i don't think we have time no we don't have uh, enough to, today to unfortunately uh, uh, but here is a proclamation here's a proclamation saying look you have to make sure that you follow the rules of war follow the rules mm. of war in this situation. So we see a lot of excesses. Mm -hmm. Only one white man was killed, $175,000 in damage uh, done to plantations. But, but the cumulative impact of this rebellion and three, uh, two other rebellions meant that the British were able now to say, look, let us end this slave system or not these enslaved people are going to take the country away from us as they did in Haiti. So 1816, Peter, mm -hmm. 1823 in Demerara, and then 1831, those rebellions convinced the British government that they had to abolish slavery, lest they lose their countries or they lose their territories to the enslaved blacks. So then, Part of the impact of this rebellion was emancipation. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So, in mm -hmm. essence, they won. Yes. So, when we say failure, failure hmm. to topple the, the, the planters in the field, but success, later on, success of convincing the British government that they ought to um, end slavery. And when we look at the debates in Parliament, we hear Buxton uh, and those persons saying, look, if slavery is not granted, it will be taken in another disastrous way. And I quote Buxton. Hmm. So that um, when we analyze this rebellion, we must see it as a successful emancipation in 1834 and of course in 1838 because um you know even though slavery was abolished in in 1834 mm -hmm. the planters and the british government still held out for an additional four years to squeeze the last ounce of juice huh. out of the enslaved people okay so yes. that uh, they weren't full, fully freed until 1838 but we must reference the Bussa Rebellion and other rebellions in that success. Not only the, 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 the abolitionists in England, 
not only Wilberforce and Buxton, but Bustle and Sam Sharp and those people who were waging war and putting their lives at, on the line. Waging war for a just society. And that is why we must always remember Bassa. Waging war for a just society in Barbados. Wow. And then we still also have to remember people like Nanny Gregg. Yes. And um, I think one of the things that stuck out for me when, when, you know, hearing about her and so on was the fact that she could read. You know, mm -hmm. that was unheard of at that time. Mm -hmm. And that was also part of the danger of not teaching them to read because she could read, she could share the information, the news of what was happening, you know. Um, and so she was a pretty interesting woman, for sure. And, and you know, in addition to Nanny, who uh, survived this rebellion, uh, we are now researching evidence and finding it that Nanny died in the 1840s, Ooh. that she did not uh, perish, and we're, we're still researching it, so I don't want to uh, okay, make any yes, understood. points yet, but we're mm -hmm. still researching it, that Nanny might have survived this rebellion. But I want to make the point about um, literacy um, in an enslaved population. We have the work of Carol Watson in his uh, book um, about Old Doll. And Carol Watson references an enslaved black, Betsy Newton, who ran away from Newton in 1795, managed to draw a link with a captain of a, slit, a ship to St. Vincent, and then Peter, guess mm -hmm. what? What? To Britain. To Britain. And she knocked on the door of her absentee owner, Thomas Lane. Yes. Knocked on his door, and she had two interviews with him. Two interviews. She castigated the management of the plantation at Newton, and asked for her son Robert to be freed. And if I, you could see um, her letters, you know, well written, she's heading up her letters, my honored master, wow. well written. She is a literate woman. She's one of the enslaved people that um, was not buried at Newton. She uh, married in England and um, you know, did not return to Barbados, but they could not have arrested her Why and not? take her back to Barbados because okay. this was after the 16, the 17, oh, 72, okay. Mansfield yes. Yes. and judgment. Yeah. So yeah. when you're talking about literacy, we have to include these people like Betsy Newton at Newton Plantation. We have so many um, real stories that our filmmakers can tell, don't we? We definitely do. So, uh, and that. the impact, uh, we have just a few minutes left, on, on, unfortunately, um, was the, the main one was, was emancipation. But when we look at it today, in 2022, how is that rebellion still impacting us today? That's a very good question, Peter. Um, there is a view that we should forget the rebellion, hmm. that the rebellion is the rebellion of the past. Let us move forward in building our nation. I differ. I believe that we should remember the rebellion, remember the struggles. That, that rebellion tells us something, that enslaved people were generals they were colonels they knew about military maneuvers but not only that 
but that they fought a fight for our freedom. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the impact, that impact still creates a conversation today about the rebellion. So people are still talking about it. But I think we got to go a bit further, Peter. Mm -hmm. We have one monument, but I think we need to erect several more monuments to really drive home that impact. Because really and truly, that book really called the Emancipation Statue. We rechristened it as a nation. But I think we need more monuments to drive home that view. Least yes. people forget drive home that Bussa happened and that Bussa was the leader and St. Philip is a good place to put those monuments, Christ Church is a good place to put those monuments and um, there is still discussion today about the rebellion I know in 2001 there was a big debate big debate um, in Barbados about whether Bussa was the leader. That debate has been settled, I believe, at yes. this stage because we've been able to find evidence that 60 years after the Bussa Rebellion, during this 1876 Confederation struggle, people were talking about Bussa mm -hmm. and remembering Bussa. So today, 206 years later, we ought to remember him talk about him tell our school children about him put up memorials more plaques um, on this rebellion quite i agree i agree and one of the things that we want to be able to do more of is this to to give history life and and you know to to put the humanity back into history i think that you know Sometimes we just look at it as a series of numbers and facts and dates yes. and so on yes. and statistics, but you forget the human element. And as I was saying with, with Senator King um, before we chatted that, you know, I'm glad that the educating part of the season of emancipation is going to be happening um, in this particular season. Thank you so much, Dr. Carter. One of the discussions that is coming out of the whole emancipation um, discourse is that of reparations, and that's what I'm going to be looking at next. And if you have some time to just stay with us, that would be nice. I know that yeah, you've, okay. you know, been busy, but um, it would be interesting. We have a joining us next on the link up, His Excellency David Comichon our ambassador to CARICOM and the deputy chair of the African Union, His Excellency Kwesi Korte. So we're also going to have Dr. Henderson Carter. So we'll be back after the break. Thank you. Today we celebrate the 206th anniversary of the Bussa Rebellion and we're looking at it, you know, 
down the road um, 206 years on, this is what we're saying. And we've had an interesting discussion about the actual season of emancipation itself. However, Dr. Carter has brought it to life, the actual rebellion, what he called the war on freedom. And moving on from emancipation, the discourse is changing more than ever to reparations. What are reparations? And what form will they take? Who will receive these reparations? All of these questions are questions which are being asked by those who are part of the, ins the ancestors of the enslaved and the enslavers. So let's chat right now, get some clarity from our CARICOM ambassador, His Excellency David Comichon, from the Deputy Chair of the African Union, His Excellency Ambassador Corte, and Dr. Henderson Carter. So nice to see you gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure, Peter. <laughs> Now, Ambassador Comichon, I, I know that yours has been a voice, strong and strident in the whole idea of there's got to be some accountability, and accountability in terms of reparations. Can you give us an idea, please, of where are we now and what your idea is? of reparations themselves. Thanks, Peter. Well, reparations basically is compensation um, for the damage done by the commission of crimes, fundamental crimes under international law. And in the case of the Caribbean, those crimes are the genocide against the indigenous people of the Caribbean and the crimes against humanity that were committed, the multiple crimes against humanity that were committed against our um, African and African descended ancestors, uh, the damage of which we still experience today. Mm -hmm. And so reparations is based in international law. It's not, not about charity. It's that uh, um, fundamental crimes were committed and crimes that go to the level of genocide and crimes against humanity are, are not crimes to which any statute of limitations apply. So they can be prosecuted um, even hundreds of years later. Okay. And basically, in, in relation to reparations based on enslavement. Um, what, we are, what we are saying is um, that for hundreds of years, Europe um, looted and plundered and victimized multiple generations of black or African people um, in, the, in these Caribbean territories. Uh, multiple generations of our people uh, they did not get to enjoy or to keep any of the fruits of their labor. They were enslaved, the fruits of their labor siphoned off to European families, European companies and institutions, ultimately to the national governments and capitals of Europe. And so, so Europe's development was purchased at the price of the systematic underdevelopment of Africa and the Caribbean. And so as a result of that history, we, our people and our nations now possess a fundamental right to development. And those European nations, those national governments are under an obligation to facilitate that, that development. And so when we conceive of reparations, um, we in the Caribbean, we don't think of it in terms of any individual cash payments. We really think of it in terms of development, development programs to, to, to undo the underdevelopment 
and the systematic damage that was done by Europe over a period of centuries. Okay, um, I think that uh, the internet with with Doctor uh, and His Excellency Quarte has um, frozen there a little. I hope that we can get him back. Well, we still have Doctor Carter with us, and Doctor Carter, as a historian, you have just shared with us some of the brutalities um, of the times and the times which a rebellion or a revolt like the Abbasid Rebellion has been formed. But have you, within your own um, space, your own headspace, thought about reparations? Have you, have you, you know, given a, a thought to them? And if you have, you know, could you share those thoughts with us, if you don't mind? You're muted. I'm not Maybe. hearing. Oh, okay, good. I can hear you now. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. believe it is important that Caribbean people understand what reparations is all about, what the movement is all about. And in my view, we can strengthen the, the um, call for reparations through historical investigation. And I see my role as investigating those crimes, investigating that bar barbarity that occurred. That strengthens the view in my view. For example, it's not enough to say that slavery existed. Mm -hmm. But we need to say, yes, slavery existed and this happened. This happened at this point. For example, 1692 in Barbados, a conspiracy, not a revolt, a conspiracy. We have a, an attempt by the platters to crush the conspiracy. And, and I quote from Hillary, Sir Hillary Eccles in his book. He said that the, the, those convicted were to be placed in a gibbet starved to death within the gibbet, after death to be beheaded, heads to be placed on a pole, bodies to be cut in quarters, body parts burned to ashes. Those are the ones who were um, executed. Then he says, 42 of them were castrated. Good 42 Lord. of them, and they paid a woman to castrate these in enslaved blacks. That is the type of, of evidence that exists to move the people, to move the consciousness of the people, to see that these things happen. I also quote from Sir Hillary again, coffee. he talks about an enslaved black Peter Boone, B-O-O-N-E, who was convicted for stealing a pig. And, and look at the penalty for this conviction, stealing a pig. He was to be cut to pieces, have his bowels burnt, and his quarters placed before the public for their viewing. For stealing, for stealing a, a pig. pig. And you know, Peter, we ran a story on the program today in Beijing history that is, is done on VOB mm -hmm. last week. And this was the story. It's, eight, it's an 1885 story where at Draxall Plantation, this, 18, this is the 1880s, you know, slavery had finished 50 years ago, where a woman on the plantation brought a cane. It was about 10, 11 o'clock that morning. She broke a cane was about to suck her cane, she was arrested by the watchman. She gave trouble. She gave a lot of trouble. She resisted arrest. They had her tied down, placed in a car. Then her husband came to her rescue. And that husband fought with the watchman. But of course, they were able to subdue the husband as well. The lady 
was taken to District C. Charge, and guess what? Mm -hmm. According to the report, a medical board met and they presumed her mad and she was taken to the lunatic asylum. And it came about because she was stealing a cane. These are the type of injustices and abuses our people went through. A lot of Barbadians want to, you know, say, well, let slavery be the past. But I think it is important for us to investigate, to do this investigation, to support this movement for reparations. My view is, if people are aware of what really happened at Spice Town in 1675, what really happened uh, uh, during this 1816 rebellion, where over a thousand people, according to this anonymous author, were killed in battle, then they would understand what Bassa fought for. Then they will understand the concept of reparations. Ambassador Comichon, I'm 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 wondering many things right now, and and it's good to see Ambassador um, Corte back. So perhaps I will say welcome to you, sir, and. Please give us the, the view from the other side, from the beginning of the journey. We, we, we discuss what's happening here, but could you give us some idea where your thoughts are on reparations, on the whole idea of accountability? David again, um, the Caribbean and the African people go back a long way in the whole history of slavery. And as uh, the Prime Minister of Barbados spoke so eloquently at Ghana's independence recently, he kept most of all places. The issue of reparations is an idea whose time has come. And we have to look at the history, the vehicles that was undertaken to organize the whole slave trade business. Let us remember that slave, the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, was the business of the day. It took 400 years, and it started with uh, the chart of King in Charles II, and he enjoined citizens to form the Royal Africa Company to go in search of slaves, ivory, gold, diamonds, and negroes, and arm them. So a lot of violence was committed in West Africa, in Africa, and it mobilized some of the chiefs, and that was beginning of the whole process, which ends, ended up in Barbados, in the Caribbean, in the United States, in Americas. So we, we're looking at a phenomenon which is very large, which is very deep, and we need to study it both at a macro and a micro level, and to mobilize public opinion, because it is only when we are able to mobilize public opinion that we can raise the legal arguments and the popular agitation to right some of these wrongs because there's every attempt to brush this under the carpet. So the work done by people like say Hillary, the Caribbean uh, Reparation Commission needs to be joined up with the work of the African Union. And we need to broaden the base of the research and get more details out. So thank you very much. This is first of all an exercise in public, public preparation as well as an exercise in looking for the nitty gritty, the vast atrocities that pervaded the whole business of the transatlantic slave trade, which has brought about the African diaspora, both in the Caribbean, 
in the United States, in Barbados, in the Jamaica, and all that. But thank you. This is an argument that we have. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. We, we tend to forget, you know, it was a, a transatlantic um, trade and that it was a business. And when I'm speaking to you, I'm thinking of Haiti. And I'm thinking of Haiti still being punished for freeing itself. And nothing has happened, um, Ambassador Comichon, in terms of Haiti and France. France owes Haiti so much in terms of the need for its development, but what's what? Sorry, go ahead. Yes, um, when we when we are talking about reparations, we are talking about, as I said, crimes against humanity and genocide, fundamental crimes in international law, and we are looking at all of the elements of damage. So yes, we are looking at the horrible punishments and the horrible violence and terrorism that was inflicted on generations of black or African people. We are looking at the, the, the interruption of Africa's developmental trajectory. We are looking at the looting of resources, um, the, the plundering, um, the, 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 the fact that you enslaved generations of African people, you siphoned off all of the fruits of their, their labor. Um, we are looking at the un unjust enrichment because the other side of the coin was as African people were enslaved, victimized, terrorized, looted and plundered, um, the Europe was, was, was developing itself by that process. Europe's development was purchased at the expense of Africa's underdevelopment. So the unjust enrichment, that whole massive industrial civilization of Europe, um, it was only possible because of the systematic looting and plundering and, and, and terrorizing of African people um, on the continent and in the, and in the diaspora. One, one good way of approaching it is to look at uh, what happened when slavery was abolished. Um, in, in the British Empire, the British government purported to, to value the then existing generation of enslaved people and in the British Empire. And so they worked out what was the labor value of these people. And they came up with a, with a, a, a sum of 47 million pounds. And they decided that they were going to compensate the planter class for the loss of this property valued at 47 million pounds. And they compensated them by paying them 20 million pounds in cash and the other 27 million pounds in free labor. So our ancestors were supposed to be free, but the, but the uh, British government said that they must <coughs> give an additional six years of free labor to the um, slave owning class in order to to pay that additional 27 million pounds in compensation now when you work out what the british government calculated the value of that one generation of enslaved africans to be it works out at 178 billion pounds in today's values now so that is their assessment of of the labor value of one generation but it was not just one generation there were multiple generations who were enslaved and worked to death on the plantations yes. and it wasn't also when you're thinking of compensation you're not just thinking about the the labor value either you're thinking about all of those punishments that that terrorism those murders, those rapes, those brandings, those executions, um, those whippings, 
that um, that Henderson Henderson spoke about, and yes. and of course the the people of Haiti, um, you, you know, suffered tremendously. Not not only during the period of enslavement, all of the the punishments and the looting and plundering, but also even after they won their freedom, quite the the French government imposed this um, 150 million um, gold franc debt on them. Yes. And, and, and that became an additional source of, of victimization and plundering of the, of the Haitian people. So that is what the reparations claim is really all about. It, mm -hmm. it is about undoing that tremendous damage that was done to, to, to the African continent, and to the, the, the black and African and native people Quite. of the Caribbean. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, you know, I'm sorry, y'all are sharing some numbers that, that, that just had me um, in terms of today's costs, um, today's rates, billions and, and so on. You realize then um, how much, just how much money we're actually talking about. But when we come back, I want to... I want to ask a question. Are the proponents, the, um, the advocates and so on for reparations, are you all speaking with one voice? I'm going to ask that when we come back. When we speak of reparations, you know, we are speaking not just in the emotional sense, we are also speaking legally, morally, politically. And I'm asking now, are we all speaking with one voice? Because while some have proposed what um, Ambassador Comijon has been speaking of, and that is within the broader context. Many people have been looking at reparations within an individual context. So I ask, are we speaking with one voice? Oh, I believe we need to 
do more of that. We need to coordinate and harmonize the positions between the Caribbean, between Africa, and even between the Caribbean, the Black America, and the Dara, and the continent. The, the issue we are, we are talking about is so deep and so vast that we cannot afford not to be united. We need to continuously harmonize. And the more we do that, the greater the chances are that we cannot be ignored because there's a, a deliberate attempt to brush this matter under the carpet. And we need to strategize to make sure that it is right front and center. And to do that, we need to look at the history. We need to do, look at the laws which were, which were passed. We need to look at where the laws were passed from, the, the royal family, the parliament, and all the aspects of it. So this, this I'm, I'm very glad that the, this matter is being discussed at this level. But it needs to go beyond this. It needs to go into the Commonwealth. It needs to go into the whole study of empire. It is really deeper than we imagine. Thank you. You? Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, um, I'm, I'm so happy to have Brother Casey on Hi. this program because um, this is a physical <laughs> um, representation of the linkages we have to make between the reparations movement in the Caribbean. Thank you and the movement in, in Africa. But you know, in 2013, CARICOM launched its reparations campaign, and we established a prime ministerial subcommittee on reparations, also a CARICOM reparations commission, uh, which is headed by Sir Hilary Beckles. And that CARICOM um, reparations commission has the power to, to, to allow observer membership of various um, reparations bodies from, from across, across the world. Um, so CARICOM is in, a, is in a fortunate position in that um, we have a reparations campaign that is both governmental, at, 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 uh, involving our governments, but also has that kind of civil society um, dimension as well. The CARICOM Reparations Commission has been very influential in providing a model um, for, for other civil society reparations movements across the world. So for example, the, the National Reparations Commission of the United States of America, which is civil society, they, were, um, they took inspiration from the CARICOM Reparations Commission and the CARICOM Reparations Commission actually helped them um, to, to come together and to form their, their body. At the, at the level of our governments, we have decided in CARICOM that the, our next step really is to reach out to the, the countries of Africa, to reach out to the African Union and the member states of the African Union. And we are saying to the African Union and those governments that we want, we want them to partner with us on, um, in this campaign for, for reparations. And um, we, last year in September, we had the first Africa CARICOM Heads of Government Summit. And uh, one of the decisions taken at that summit is that we should establish a permanent forum of African and Caribbean territories and states. And that that permanent forum could become an institutional setting in which Africa and the Caribbean will collaborate on, on several issues, including, very importantly, um, reparations. My, my opinion is, I'm, I'm with Kwesi, um, this has to be, and reparations has to be an international mass movement that, that, that joins us together. So, so yes, we have to bring everybody on board, but it is important that Africa and the Caribbean be in the vanguard because it is Africa and the Caribbean where you will find um, black governments, black governments that can operate at the highest level of, of um, the international environment, that have 
seats in the United Nations, um, um, for example, that possess embassies and high commissions all, all over the world. So, so yes, Peter, um, we, we have to try to unify the, 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 the movement. We have to try as much as possible to speak with, with one voice. And um, there's a great responsibility on the governments, the national governments of Africa and, and the Caribbean to be in the vanguard of that movement. Thank you, Ambassador. You know, unfortunately, we had um, MP Lisa Hanna of Jamaica join, uh, she was to join us today and she was part of the uh, Reparations Commission um, of, of CARICOM and it would have been you know nice to get her voice on that but unfortunately she couldn't she couldn't make it after all but I go back to to Africa because um, you hear of the atrocities of on this side but when you consider that they lost some of their strongest and their youngest um, those who would have been building up the, the, the continent, you know, um, in the prime of their lives. The question is asked, how does one put a price on that? How does one put a price on life? The, the landowners did it. Um, they came up with that figure, that 47 million pounds. But how can we, on the other side, put a price um, and then who is to pay that price is it going to be the European countries who one considered benefited um, the North American continent which also benefited so the questions are asked how does one arrive at that price and who then is going to pay that price and when that price then is decided and negotiated on at the end of the day how then is it going to be shared so can those questions be answered now <laughs> yes the, those questions well they can't be answered in totality no not in totality but for example I, I i will tell you that um Prime Minister Motley, who is the chair of CARICOM's Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on Reparations, she is just about to send out a round of letters to nine European heads of government um, whose countries were all involved in um, enslavement of our people and who profited um, from the enslavement and exploitation of our people inviting them to sit with CARICOM to engage in a dialogue to work out how they can make recompense, how they can um, repair some of the damage that was done. You're quite right, Peter, it's going to be difficult to come up with a precise figure. In fact, if, you know, if we begin with that figure of 47 million pounds which mm -hmm. is 178 billion dollars a billion pounds sorry in, in yes. present day values for just for just the labor value of one generation nothing to do with the with the whippings and the new deals and and, no. and and all the rest of it no you you imagine not nothing to do with the destruction on the continent of africa itself but if you're already talking a money value, it would be a, a, a tremendous money value. Mm -hmm. And this is why our approach is that, look, as a result of that undoubted history, we now possess a right to development. And so we have said to the European government, we have given them a 10-point demand. And that 10-point demand is all about development. It's about, it is about uh, money for healthcare systems, for education, technology transfer, um, debt cancellation. So it, it is about development. But we have also said, it's not only the governments. Yes, the governments are primary because they 
constitute the institutional link between the president and the past, but they are also the private sector companies, the Lloyds of London, the Barclays Bank, yes. um, the, the Oxford the universities, it's the families, the Drax family, the royal family. All of them benefited and all of them have to contribute. So it is going to be the national governments in terms of a developmental um, compact, developmental programs. It will be companies and institutions, families, in terms of making cash, um, cash payments. And it even goes further, Peter. Mm -hmm. It is also the international economic and political order that exists today, which has its roots in those centuries of criminal enslavement and exploitation and colonization of our people, and which is still an unjust system because what they did is that they then inserted our African and Caribbean nations into this, this international order in a structurally subordinate and still exploitative manner. So part of the, the, the campaign for reparations is also a reparative restructuring of the currently existing international economic and political order. A good example, United Nations Security Council. There's exactly. no black or African country that is a permanent member. So, so all of that is part of our reparations campaign. And, um, and again, it emphasizes why it is a very big campaign. And obviously, the CARICOM countries, we can't do it alone. We need the weight and strength of the continent of Africa. And then even beyond that, we need to mobilize an international mass movement. We need allies, um, not, not just African people, but also allies um, in, in, in the, the European uh, countries, you know, mm -hmm. peace movements, the churches, the trade unions, wherever we can get allies for what is a righteous and just cause. And I think that when we think of what Dr. Carter said uh, a little earlier when he said utilizing the universities as like your private detectives, you know, um, getting um, all the dirt and, and documenting it so that you've got it there. This is what happened and this is proof of what happened. And we have, you know, this is only part of it. Um, so we're going to take a quick break. And, and when we come back, um, I think Dr. Carter is still with us. And I want to find out his thoughts on what, what we, we, we just discussed when we come back. There are some questions I have for Dr. Carter. And Dr. Carter, one is this. There's a discussion um, that, that I, you know, I saw online where people said that modern day white Americans did not own slaves. And I'm wondering, does slavery still exist in pockets around this world of ours? Oh yes, oh yes, there's lots of evidence that um, slavery continues in different ways. And um, you know, there's sex slavery, there is, um, it, there are individuals who use people as sex slaves and you know Peter in much the same way as they did 
in the 18th and the 19th century. For example, the slave owners, in the 17th, used to hire out individuals to the garrison in uh, Barbados. In other words, you would have your females during the out of crop season and you would hire them out. And they would go, for example, for six months and they were supposed to come back after six months with two things. One, money in their pocket for the enslaver. And two, they were supposed to come back home in the family way. Hmm. And that went on for a very, very long time. And when you want, and, and you could trace that right up to today, mm -hmm. where individuals are still involved, still involved in, in that type of activity. And, you know, I want to, to, to go back quickly to something that uh, David said, Ambassador Kamishan said, he said, he talked about the um, billions that Af that Europeans pocketed. They also pocketed from the manumission funds that were paid to these slave owners during that period, 1834 to 1838. So that uh, enslaved person had the right to by his or her manumission and they did in large numbers as a matter of fact right up to august 1838 july sorry people were still buying their manumission all across the caribbean and we have not properly accounted for those funds that were received um by the slave bastards so people paid for their own manumission so that you're adding that to the, 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 the 20 mil, million that they receive um, in cash. So I want to make the point, therefore, that yes, that um, there are good grounds for reparations. And I think, though, that we need to broaden the scope of reparations. We have Africa. Caribbean, we also have to broaden it to the diaspora to mm -hmm. get people on board. And in addition to broaden it, we have to deepen reparations debate. For example, our children and our grandchildren must know about reparations. They must know about the concept and why we are asking for reparations. It must go into the schools and already um, on the Cape syllabus, there is a module for, uh, on reparations. And I would like to see as teachers teach history, social studies, or even civics here in Barbados, that um, the, the concept of reparations uh, is taught and that the, the evidence for this genocide, the evidence for this uh, inhumanity to um, African slaves in the region that is presented to our children so that our children have an understanding of the concept and our children can push the governments even harder, even harder to make um, those moves on our behalf. I think that if there's a ground swell for it, like there was a ground swell against um, the Nelson statue in 2020, when people signed petitions, marched and came out and the government reacted, there needs to be that type of ground swell here um, in this country. And of course, across the Caribbean for reparations. A word from you, Ambassador Quate. You have like a minute. I'm sorry, time has just flown by. Sorry. Simply, simply, simply to remind you that I'm no longer an African Union. I'm, I'm now, but uh, this subject is a subject that is of intense interest to us, and we we'll continue to follow it. And we thank you for bringing this up. Thank you. 
Jean, final you. word for you. Uh, yes, well, um, the, this is, reparations is probably the single most important issue for us because the reparations claim, the reparations logic is at the heart of so many things, whether it is the, the climate injustice that has been inflicted upon us that we mm -hmm. need to be compensated for, whether it is the, 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 the black listing and, and the way in which um, former enslaving powers have arrogated to themselves this continuing power um, to dominate over our, our affairs. Uh, it is the reparations argument and the reparations of logic that it is, is going to give us the ammunition and going to give us the moral authority to turn back and to you know to re re revamp um, many of these unjust structures and and practices. So reparations ultimately is about creating an, an, a new world, a, a world of, of justice and humanity and equality and and fairness. And um, and it is our responsibility as the the people, the descendants of of the persons who experienced the the most horrific denial of their human rights and who and who had to fight um, for freedom and for human dignity. Um, our history has bequeathed to us um, the mission um, to lead to lead this charge, not only for ourselves, but yes. on, on behalf of a world that really needs um, healing and repair. Thank you so much, Ambassador Kwame Jean. Thank you so much, Dr. Carter. Thank you for joining us today on this very special discussion on the Busser Rebellion 206 years on. Thank you for joining us on the link up today. And basically, we can say that the rebellion continues. So you stay safe and stay well. Until next time, next Thursday at 10. Thank you for joining us on the link up.